Hello and welcome back to Kilmainham Jail for another one of our Kilmainham Jail on Lockdown videos. This is part four of our series on the uh, Invincibles and the events that took place in Kilmainham in 1883. And in our last video, we looked at how uh, Inspector Mallon, uh, the police officer in charge of investigating what was referred to at the time as the Phoenix Park murders, how he managed to uh, turn James Carey, the head of the Invincibles, and persuaded him uh, to confess uh, to save uh, his own life. Uh, and also uh, he managed to get him to uh, testify against his former comrades and uh, they obviously saw this as a betrayal because his testimony in Green Street Courthouse uh, resulted in five of the Invincibles uh, being uh, charged with murder and being sentenced to hang here in Kilmainham Jail. Um, in uh, May and June 1883. Now this cell here, we've been here before on one of the other videos, it's referred to as the McCann cell because uh, on the windowsill just over here, Patrick McCann, a United Irishman, carved his name um, in August of 1798. But according to Dr Shane Kenna in his book, uh, he believed that this is where Joe Brady spent his last night before his execution. There's a very kind of touching anecdote about um, uh, his last days in, in Kilmainham Jail. Apparently, uh, Lucy Cavendish, the wife of Lord Frederick Cavendish, uh, the man that Brady and the rest of the Invincibles killed in the Phoenix Park, she wrote to him and uh, forgave him in this letter. And uh, she also enclosed a crucifix, I suppose, as a sign of her forgiveness. Now, if this is Joe Brady's um, cell, then it's also the cell of Timothy Kelly. Um, and again, there's a story that um, on the night before his execution, he was uh, executed on the 9th of June, um, the governor of the jail, uh, Governor Gildee, came to visit him. Now, um, Kelly was eating his last meal at the time, um, and it was a kind of a, a nicer meal than, than usual, and he was given um, uh, some porter to drink as well. And apparently when the governor came to, I suppose, make his farewell, um, Timothy Kelly threw the porter at him and uh, wished him uh, a long life and good health. Uh, and apparently as a result of this, uh, Kelly's uh, dinner, the rest of it that was left, was taken away from him. Um, now, uh, Shane, in his book, um, he suggests that um, some of the other men may have been uh, in the East Wing on their last night. Um, he, he specifically mentioned that uh, Dan Curley uh, might have been um, in uh, a cell in the East Wing. Um, and then Ty Hopkins, who wrote a book about the Invincibles in the 1890s and visited the jail, he includes uh, an image of uh, this room, um, the condemned cell. And uh, handily enough, we have uh, a blow-up of that image uh, just here. Uh, and he seems to suggest that this is where the men spent their last uh, nights uh, before they were hanged. Uh, what we do know is that they all woke very early uh, the morning of their execution, usually around kind of half six, uh, and they were brought to the Catholic chapel uh, for mass and uh, final prayers. Um, and while this room uh, or this, this part of the jail has been altered quite a bit, uh, over the years, we do know that this is the uh, altar that was there in uh, the 1880s. So this is what they would have been uh, kneeling in front. Um, the other interesting thing to, to think about is the fact that apparently um, at Joe Brady's uh, last mass, the other men, the other invincibles who were also awaiting their execution, they were uh, in the congregation. Uh, when uh, prayers and the religious ceremonies were over, uh, then they... Uh, would have left uh, the chapel uh, and at some point then uh, they would have been jo uh, joined uh, by uh, the governor, Governor Gildee for some of the hangings uh, the deputy governor uh, a man called uh, Thomas Fluitt um, uh, the sub-sheriff of Ormsby um, and uh, one of the last things that had to happen to them before their hanging was that they had to be pinioned uh, by the hangman and the hangman on this occasion was uh, a very famous English hangman uh, called William Marwood now it would seem in the case of um, Joe Brady 
uh, he pinioned them, he pinioned Brady in his cell, but uh, he seems to have changed his, I suppose, his modus operandi with some of the later executions uh, and pinioned them um, on their way to uh, the execution. So pinioning basically involved, uh, he had a, his own uh, invention. It was a kind of a, a belt that went around this, uh, the waist of the condemned man, and then he would have uh, had straps to tie their arms to their side um, and uh, as I said, they would have uh, been stopped at some point um, on their way to the scaffold. Um, another very kind of, I suppose, touching anecdote relates to uh, Timothy Kelly. Apparently, on his last night, uh, he sang quite a lot. He was a very gifted singer, and uh, apparently, along the corridors, you could hear um, him singing. Um, songs from Balfe's Bohemian Girl, uh, Balfe's uh, The Memory of the Past, uh, also the Salve Regina. He was um, in a choir um, and had a, a beautiful voice, apparently. So it's quite a, a melancholy thing to try and imagine. But uh, they would have progressed in great solemnity. Uh, there's a few different descriptions um, of the route they may have taken to the scaffold through the building. Uh, this is the one that uh, Shane... Uh, suggests that uh, Timothy Kelly took um, so I suppose we'll just uh, reproduce it and they would have then headed out here for their execution and that's going to be the subject of our next video